Perhaps, uh, first of all, I should uh, introduce myself a little bit um, so that you bet better can understand why I'm talking about the issue in this way, in this uh, perhaps strange way. So I was trained as an artist uh, at the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich. Um, after that, I exhibited a, a lot and then I ch changed my, my profession and I worked as a, as a teacher at a, at a secondary school. And then I started again to study art history and philosophy and I did my PhD on Max Beckmann, the, uh, the, uh, the German artist who lived for a, a long and very uh, decisive uh, period in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and I um, graduated uh, with a PhD there. Uh, so my approach to the field uh, we are talking about is, is a threefold uh, approach. Uh, a, a very practical uh, approach coming from the arts, a theoretical approach, and also a pedagogical approach. And I think Lodi will introduce himself <laughs> as well <laughs> by himself. Um, but we, ha we have a long a joint history um, and different forms of cooperation. Uh, and we now will talk about um, the title of this, this presentation is The Competence Model. And I think uh, this title already uh, is a little bit mysterious. The Competence Model sounds very normative, very final, and very definitive. And that's not true. So I would prefer to speak about a competence model. A competence model we would like to suggest, and we suggested it uh, to the Museum M. We, Lode and I, will give you an insight in what we have been discussing since about now, about two or three years. Also in other contexts, not only in the context of visual literacy and, and museums. The, the question was, how can we understand what a single person needs or is able to, uh, in, in order to be able to participate in culture in a competent way. Lode has his uh, theoretical background in the Dutch uh, Culture in the Mirror project. And my background is a European Union funded project called Common European Framework of Reference for Visual Literacy. And this is carried out Sorry, uh, this is carried out by Anvil. I, it, what we both love are museums. Uh, and this brought us together again for this wonderful occasion. And I would like to thank the organizers uh, of this conference, of this meeting, Museum M, uh, for inviting us both. Um, we divided our input in a kind of ping pong. Um, I will start with the question, if we look at a museum or at museums, can we discover already examples how museums address visual literacy? Then Lode will take over, trying to systematize these examples and develop a sound model of visual literacy, based also in research. In this part, he will also address the question how we can use the model to develop mediation programs at a museum. In the third part, I will give an example how this model can be used to reflect the work at an, in a museum. I will do this using the example of Museum M. My question is, can we apply the model to the concept of a new room, a new gallery? We hope that it will be interesting for you. Because I start, before I start, I would like to give you a very little information about an, uh, Anvil. Um, to show you the background on, uh, of which, uh, my consider, uh, uh, on which my considerations are based on. Anvil is a network founded in 2009 by art educators uh, who had all the same experience. The experience to have lack of information 
in respect to curriculum development and school in, in visual arts. At the moment, we have about 19 members from diff 15 different countries. Since 2012, we are in a close partnership with INSEA, the International Society for Education through Art. This is a global network. And we rec received funding, as already mentioned, by the European Commission from 2013-14 until 2016. And the result of, of this funding was the Common European Framework of Reference for Visual Literacy. I, and I brought one book uh, with me. Uh, for it is very heavy. I brought only one. Uh, I brought a second for Austria <laughs> from, from Riga. And I would like to give it now to, to present it now to the Um, so, Anvil uh, stresses the understanding of visual literacy as a competence. And this is important, a competence. Visual li uh, literacy, uh, not visual literacy, but li literacy in general is the ability to re read and write. And visual literacy is the ability to read and to write imagery, or better, to understand and to create images or pictures. Why we call this a competence is based on a shift of paradigms we face in education since about 20, 30 years. I cannot go deeper into this, uh, but I would like to take much more time than we have. But it is important uh, not uh, to know uh, that in the following 40 minutes, um, I will base my, 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 my considerations on this pr fundamental pre uh, assumption that we talk about visual literacy as a competence. The general understanding of a competence is that a competence always addresses a combination of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and reflection. These aspects are important as these four terms will give my observations in museums an order. I will come to this in a minute. The second aspect is that the competence is always demonstrated in a specific situation. In our case, this situation is a visit of an art museum. A visitor of an art museum is competent or he or she is not competent with regard to his visit. The third point is that a competence can also be thought of as a disposition. This means, in our case, the visitor of an art museum is able to do something in the art museum. For instance, he or she is able to understand an artwork. And the last assumption is that a competence always can be acquired and that a museum can or perhaps should be an excellent place where the visitor can acquire this competence, visual literacy. Perhaps a museum could even decide visual literacy of the, of the audience could be the main outcome of their work. And I th that's what I understood that the DNA of Museum M could be. This is already enough theory. More will come later when Lode will take over. Since I know that N will, will work on this topic, visual literacy at an art museum, in cooperation with Museum M, I'm visiting galleries and exhibitions in another way than usual, in a very specific way. Since then, I have been looking for examples how museums address knowledge, skills, attitudes, and reflections, also in the case that they are not really aware of this. And this was the order I was uh, giving in, the, in my first part attitudes, knowledge, skills, and reflection. I will show you now about 20 slides, demonstrating not only a few hopefully interesting examples I found. This collection is not at all a systematic one, but I hope it will give not only an interesting introduction, but also it will show you that museums do already a lot in respect to our topic and that we can find old, good traditions 
as well as interesting, innovative examples and ways. Let's start with the first of these dimensions of attitudes. Of course, it is a very famil familiar topic for all people working at a museum. How should the audience behave in a museum? The first example shows the audience we all like most. The audience we love. Single visitors, quiet, full of respect to, for the works of art, respect to the museum as an institution, aficionados of the museum and of art. If it is true that we all like this attitude, these people, um, and their behavior, we can start to ask, why do we like especially this one, this specific attitude? Can we describe it uh, in a clear, distinct way? And of course, and very important, we can ask, is this attitude an adequate attitude for visual literacy? Or is another one better? I will not comment this picture. When we talk about audiences or audience development, we have, of course, to take the new audiences into account. People like these Turks on the right hand side who come to the National Gallery in Berlin, they, come, they don't come for enjoying art in the traditional way. They use this specific painting in the background. It is the paint, an orientalistic painting, and the title of it is Arab Philosopher, as a background for their wedding pictures. And now I describe this situation with the words of competences. These people are able to select a picture for a distinct purpose. I would call this a meaningful competence, a subcompetence of visual literacy. Or how can we name this kind of behavior in respect to visual literacy? These people are not creative guys. They do not show that they are able to envision, to invent, to create their own new authentic images. But they are able to perceive to study. But I have to stop now, uh, but I'm, for I'm already talking about skills, and this will come later. Before getting to skills, I would like to talk about the second dimension um, of knowledge, um, of competence, and this is knowledge. I'm sure that if we ask curators, uh, most of them would agree with the sentence, a museum should build knowledge of uh, the audience. This, examples, uh, this example from Cologne represents a type of information in the gallery we all know. It shows the mastery, gra uh, masterly gra craftsmanship which is needed to make a, or to produce technically a medieval picture on a wooden panel. Exploring this example led me to the consideration that all knowledge to be learned in the museum is knowledge about different kinds of the making of. Making, in this case, making of the panel, of a panel painting. This example is about making of an exhibition. I saw many similar architectural models or similar maquettes during the last years in different museums. As, and this is important, as these, uh, these uh, models are part of the ex exhibition itself, which means the show is showing the way how it shows art. A very interesting phenomenon and an excellent case of the making of, and this is the example of William Kendrick at an exhibition in Berlin um, he gave, and this is um, the model he did himself, and it is part of the exhibition. Making of an exhibition 
does not only refer to the way of hanging the paintings or arranging sculptures. In the great, venerable, and huge museums like the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, we face new experience with the old way of hanging, of arranging paintings. In German, we call this Petersburger Hängung. I don't know but what's the translation for this in, in Dutch or in, in English. Obviously, the old way of hanging in line is no longer satisfying. But the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna did not only change the way of hanging. It represented in the exhibition that they changed something. And that's the way how they made transparent what and how, and also they explained why they changed it. So making of an exhibition. Making of an exhibition is not only a task of a museum. Museums also preserve artworks. And this means, first of all, collect and store them. I believe that the Schaulager in Zurich, in Switzerland, by the building was uh, built by Herzog and Dömerow, was the first and still is the most radical solution for this attempt. No traditional exhibition at all, but just a depot, a storage. In the meantime, we can find many more similar and, by the way, more modest examples in many places. Bringing the depots into the gallery as a part of the exhibition disseminates knowledge about what a museum does and what a museum uh, is about. Making of the museum also means making transparent the role and the tasks of museums. This is, of course, also related, for instance, to restorations. And these are examples uh, for restorations, uh, one, one Belgium from, from Ghent and, and from Brera in, in, in Mil Milan, uh, where it is, this restoration is part of the exhibition. And if you visit this museum, you, you can see this, uh, that the people are working there uh, and restoring paintings. So making of a museum does also mean uh, restoration or means to do research. This is the example also again from Ghent, um, where is the missing part of the Van Eyck altarpiece uh, in Ghent. There is something missing uh, this, uh, on the left side where, where it is black. And they did a, a showroom uh, in, in explaining how they explored how, how to, to, to get a, a knowledge about this. So doing research is, is also part of the making of, of, of a museum. Or the last slide on, 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 on knowledge is uh, this example from Hamburg I saw um, one, one week ago. So it's questioning uh, the, the question of, about the provenance of a specific work. An important issue in Germany at the moment regarding the question of restitution to former owners, mainly Jewish owners, who had been expropriated by the Nazis. Many more examples could be added to demonstrate the current trend at museums to show their making of, and by this not only to disseminate knowledge about the work of art, but also about the museum or the collection itself. I will come back to this important issue later. As already mentioned, skills are very important and perhaps the most important dimension in competence. Because skill, stills, uh, skills are the only aspect we really can observe as mediators, as teachers, researchers, or museum guides. In the beginning, I started to talk about attitudes. And then I slightly shifted during my speech uh, to skills and the way uh, skills are used. What cannot see attitudes per se, only behavior, or the way skills are used? Museums, I think, are excellent, very innovative and inventive in fostering diverse skills, also in regard to visual literacy. 
As I mentioned in the beginning, giving the definition of what a competence is, I said that being a competent visitor means that the visitor is able to do something in the art museum. For instance, the visitor is able to compare what he or she sees on the one hand side with an image showing a early, an earlier stage. To be able to compare, to, f to find differences, to start questioning about what happened, these abilities or capacities we can call skills, skills as subcompetences of visual literacy. To compare is perhaps one of the most important skills. By comparison, the visitor can find out not only what happened, as we saw in the Cologne example in the previous slide, but also to discover surprising similarities across centuries. Like, for instance, how gender issues are addressed in artworks. And we see an example of a combination of Titian and, and Jürgen Klauke uh, in, in Salzburg uh, last year. Or of Jeff Koons and Luca della Robbia uh, in Frankfurt and uh, Liebighaus uh, in 2012. To compare to co discover not only similarities, but also differences, and to work with the results is essential for what we call to be able to perceive, or much more simple, to be able to see. To be able to see why an artist like, for in this example, Liebermann chose himself a specific frame is already this skill of to be able to see. And this is on a very high level already. The, vitter, uh, the visitor in this case has to see in his imagination how the impression of the painting changes when this specific frame is added. Curators know how difficult it is to find the right frame for a painting, artists as well. And now the visitor is invited to do the same in his imagination. To be able to imagine or to envision is, very, is a very important subcompetence as well. And I found this wonderful example in the Torvaldsen Museum in Copenhagen. It is an invitation to imagine the room with artist sculptures, only bases, only pedestals in the gallery. This is a situation in which normally only curators are. Looking at this digital montage, I think we have to consider the curator as the most competent, visual competent visitor. He must be, the curator must be, the visual literate on the highest level. And this means the curator can be seen as a role model, a blueprint for the visitor's skills. If we do this, to think about the relation between the visitor and, and the museum um, in respect to these terms, if we do this, I think this will change a lot in our expectations to the skills of the audience. What a curator does is also to make decisions. And to be able to decide means, or includes, to be able to judge, to evaluate, also to value. This example from Hamburg Kunsthalle shows the last three acquisitions the Kunsthalle did in 2016. And they are shown together in one room, and the visitor is asked which of the artworks he or she had preferred to buy. And we, can, we, and we can find a counter, a manual counter, uh, related to each of these works of art. The visitor is asked which of the works he or she had preferred. And he, he hits the, the counter. And then he can see the numbers of, of, of counts. Um, and this shows him uh, whether his judgment is similar or different to the average judgment. This means it's not only the curator who is the model of the visitor, 
but also the, the director, the decision maker. Let me now give three last examples of what I would call reflection in a museum. Ref reflection, some call it also metacognition, is the most complicated issue in this context. And, and Lode and I are still working on hard on uh, finding a good way how this can be con conceptualized and also researched. Reflection for me means that the visitor is able to reflect himself as a visitor. He observes his own observing. And this sounds very complicated, and it is. But we can find many examples in galleries that try to create situations which allow the audience to do this. The first possibility that the visitor, um, or I as a visitor can see, is the other, the other visitor. And the other visitor could be a point of comparison. How does he behave, he or she behave? What does he do? Is it similar to this or the same, or is it different? What I do, what I believe, beha uh, how I behave as a visitor. The second option um, is perhaps this example. I think you all know this example. Uh, it's Amsterdam, the Rex Museum. And this example shows that reflection of the visitor is not only an aspect uh, um, which is related to the visitor uh, as himself, as a visitor of the museum. It is also related um, to the visitor outside, or the, 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 the person who is, who is just coming by on his bicycle. So reflection is also related to the audience that doesn't enter the building. I cannot go deeper into this, but this is of utmost interest because it brings in the question of borders. In this case, of the border between in and out. The wall of a museum is this border. And to make it permeable has also to do with the self-understanding of the museum as an institution in the 21st century. Two very last examples how observation of observation, observation of observation can be addressed in an art museum is perhaps this example. These examples, many artworks offer already, especially modern artworks, uh, offer already similar issues. And of course, museums could use them as examples. But I think I have already talked too much, and that's why I would like to give now the floor to Lode. Good morning. Uh, I am Lode Vermeers, um, senior researcher at the university here in uh, Leuven, and my uh, research interests lie in the field of uh, arts and cultural uh, education. And I'd like to move together with you uh, towards uh, the, the actual model. And uh, Ernst has mentioned a lot of things uh, related to that. Um, so you get a, get a view of what the actual model looks like and uh, that what which uh, is used here in the museum. Now, it is believed that um, when babies are born the first few days, they see the world, world like this. Uh, they don't see the uh, a museum right away, I guess, um, maybe soon after they're born, but uh, they actually see the world uh, upside down. And why is that? Uh, because we all see the world upside down. Uh, that's the way we see it. Only we, our brains, are able to flip the, the data, the raw visual data we uh, perceive and see uh, the, the world as we see it. Um, children, when they're born, babies, when they're born, they, they're not able to do that, but they're able to do that within the first few days of their uh, lives. And the funny thing is, um, we don't have to teach them. They learn it by experience. Uh, and there are a lot of elements to visual literacy that we don't need to teach that come intuitively that come uh, by experience without the intervention of an educator, of a parent, uh, of a teacher, of a guide. This is the example of a, a newborn baby, but you find a lot of examples of that in uh, a museum. 
Um, let's take, for instance, uh, the photo here on your uh, on the left. When you enter a museum, even if you're still very young, uh, you have no difficulty um, interpreting or reading the signs there. You know, if you look for the bar, the bar is on the right side. The toilets are, uh, and the photography section is upstairs. Uh, you learn this by experience, you learn this by socialization. Uh, there's no need for a guide or a mediator or an educator to say, okay, you have to read it like that. Uh, and uh, another example here on the right is the difference between uh, a label and an actual artwork. Uh, in most of the cases, not all of them, but in most of the cases, we know right away what the label is and what it's meant for and what the actual artwork is. And they sometimes they get mixed up, but uh, not in a lot of cases. So apparently, a lot of visual literacy elements, uh, skills, knowledge, um, attitudes, we just simply uh, develop, but not all of them. And usually these are only the, let's say, uh, lower order thinking skills um, that we develop. Uh, but in a lot of cases, as, as visual literacy is a very complex uh, and, and, and culturally loaded issue, uh, it takes some kind of an intervention. It takes a, an, an, an effort for the learner, for the visitor, and a, a conscious effort, a learning effort. Um, but it also takes a targeted intervention by somebody else, a parent or a guide uh, or, or a teacher, or more in general, and a lot of examples refer to that, uh, the, the space, the learning, the learning environment people are uh, in. And uh, obviously an art museum is a very interesting learning environment for that, um, as it offers a lot of possibilities for, um, for people to, to train their uh, visual literacy skills. Now, wh why is that? Why is it an, an interesting place? Uh, and this brings me to one, one general question. What makes a good visual literacy practice? What is an interesting learning uh, environment? And in fact, you could divide that general question into three, three more uh, specific questions. Um, first of all, um, now what does it really mean to be visual literate? Uh, what, what is that? It is a competency. It is, consists of several elements. Uh, but when are you visual uh, literate? So this is the element of, you could say, uh, definition. Um, but we can, come all, we can all come up with uh, several uh, definitions. That's no problem. But the question more is, if you have such a broad concept uh, and a more or less f fuzzy concept, uh, can you break it into more manage manageable parts, uh, specific sub-competences, um, maybe also competency levels? Uh, and something that you can uh, work with. That's the first question. And if you have that, if you have a list of the, those sub-competences and you get an overview of what it really is, um, a clear view, are you able to link all those elements together? Do you have a, a model? Do you have a, a framework that brings all those different skills? We can co all come up with f very different skills and knowledge, etc. Uh, can we bring this together in one uh, open frame, uh, framework? And uh, this is about a question about uh, framework building. Uh, and, and maybe a framework that doesn't only work here in, in an art museum, but in other museums as well. And perhaps also one that works in a library and in a heritage uh, organization of any kind, maybe in a classroom as well. That would be interesting for collaboration if you have such a framework. And it definitely, if you have such a framework, it would ha help to systemize things, uh, to uh, structure uh, things for action and this is the third element uh, if you have such a framework what does it do in practice uh, for a museum and then you come to the element of both presenting curating an art museum and the mediation is of course a very inter in, uh, important part there as well this is these are the questions we were thinking about and we brought together uh, different um, you can you can answer those questions in different ways huh? um, and come up with different answers, of course. Uh, but what we did here, and Ernst referring to that earlier on, we brought together three types of uh, input. First of all, research and theory. A lot has been written on visual literacy over the last 40, 50 years, especially since the late 60s. A lot has been written, a lot of theory. Um, we brought that together. We looked into that for, for different frameworks. We also brought theory, uh, cultural theory, for instance, the culture in the mirror theory by uh, Barend van Heusen, which is a semiotic theory on human culture, not specific on uh, visual culture. Uh, we combined that with the work of Enville, 
uh, so the the book uh, uh, Evans referred to it, so the Common European Framework of Reference for Visual Literacy, the work that has been done by the researchers there based on, on their own research and, and other research. And of course, uh, last but certainly not, not least, the plans and the ambitions of the museum itself. Uh, what does the museum want? Uh, the experience of the museum, uh, they have a lot of an immense uh, amount of experience in, in curating mediation, uh, etc. So we all threw that in the mix, you could say, uh, to um, make a clear model. Okay, visual literacy. It is a competency. It consists of different elements. Uh, in my own words, it is a way to intelligently handle visual inputs and to uh, navigate different visual environments. Uh, Ernst gave a lot of um, examples of that. Um, we all do that differently, of course. Uh, we all we all do that. We we uh, uh, navigate visual environments differently, and we 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 are faced with different uh, visual environments uh, uh, all the time. So, in fact, that brings me to a first conclusion. I think it's a personal thing, visual literacy. It is related to uh, yourself, the self competences uh, you already have. It's also, it's not hard to see that it's also a social thing. It's also a social competency because it is based on, on expression, on communication, all those things you can do on your own. You need uh, somebody else for it, you need at least two persons. So it's a, a social, social competency uh, as well. It's related to social contexts. And a third thing is if we all agree that uh, unlike the babies who are able to uh, flip uh, images they have, uh, we are, if we agree that it takes a kind of intervention, it takes a kind of education or training, uh, it, it is also an, a methodological uh, uh, element uh, in the competency. Okay. That being said, um, what does the actual model look like? Um, I will now try to take one step back and try to divide the, the fuzzy, the general concept of visual literacy into uh, those more specific uh, parts. Uh, we as human beings are able to uh, collect uh, different types of data through our senses, okay? And being able to um, handle or to deal with, with what we taste, what we uh, feel, what we see, uh, what we smell, is I think our basic, um, our basic motivation for culture. And when it comes to visual literacy, of course, visual perception, what we see is a very uh, important element. <clears throat> it's a, a sub-competency and you could say, what, what is visual perception? It is nothing more than simply uh, collecting and selecting uh, visual inputs, uh, perceptual uh, data. That's, that's the basis, I think. Um, in fact, you could, uh, the, the, the Latin word of, uh, or the Latin root of the word literacy uh, means actually those two things. It's, it's collecting and selecting, something more. And that's what we do all day long from the moment we wake up uh, and open our eyes. That's, that's what we do. We, we uh, collect and select um, visual images. And this is done intuitively. Um, <clears throat> we cannot block that. If we open our eyes, we cannot block what we see. Uh, so we notice things. But we also do this with a certain intention. And that's interesting as a competency or sub-competency. We explore things. Um, we um, look for things and we try to capture things. And what we do immediately is we link what we see to what we already know. And we say, okay, I recognize that or I don't recognize that. And uh, by that simple act, we also try directly to name things, to describe things, uh, even if it's still uh, only in, uh, in our head. Okay, what does this mean for an art museum? In fact, if you think about it, art museums uh, <clears throat> hinder a lot of possibilities for perception. You would think otherwise, but um, it is forbidden, and most of the museums is forbidden to uh, touch the artworks, so you cannot really feel them. How can you smell a painting? Mm, difficult. Can, can you hear a painting? Maybe you can, but it takes a lot of imagination. Um, so in fact, you could say that uh, the visual arts are in fact a very f uh, an art form that creates distance um, and that has very little function outside of the the, the visual one. 
Uh, but still, I think <coughs> art museum can play a very interesting role in triggering uh, the competency of, of uh, the sub competency of uh, a perception, obviously, and it can train uh, curiosity, visual curiosity, the ability to select, to focus, uh, to uh, coordinate, like the, um, the example Adams gave, coordinate different types of inputs, uh, different types of visual inputs, or, for instance, uh, musical input together with visual input, uh, etc. Okay, and of course, mediation is a very important element here. Here, uh, by asking the right questions as a guide or as an educator, you can help people to uh, focus, select, uh, collect uh, different uh, types of images. Uh, that's important there as well. Okay, a second step. There are four steps in total. The second step is we can do more than simply collect what we um, what we see. We can. Um, this is a great ability. We can manipulate, uh, in fact, what we see and what we saw. This happens uh, in a cognitive way. We can really bring images together in our head and we can make something new out of that. And we can do this on, on, on a mental level. Um, so you can think of two paintings now and you can make a mix of them in your head. Or you, I can, could show you a photo, uh, a photo of my children and I can imagine what they're doing right now and you could Perhaps uh, if you have children and you look at, at their photo, you can imagine that, oh, yeah, they're in the classroom right now and uh, they're there. You can, this is Im what I call imagination. And uh, this is one element. This is a very concrete uh, and creative process. But you can also, it's also a springboard for creative expression, as we know it, making things uh, visible. So this is a second step um, in, in the model um, on both mental level, wondering, imagining, envisioning, but also the actual uh, making, drafting, experimenting, etc. What is the role here for um, an art museum? Again, and we saw this example before, I think it is up to an art museum to trigger that, the, the visual creativity and the imagination in all different ways, by showing the artworks, first of all, but even more, by showing them in a certain way. And here is an example uh, um, of leaving things out, of only showing part of the artwork that could trigger imagination. Uh, uh, show them in a surprising context, that could work as well. Uh, showing from a different angle you wouldn't expect. Um, showing the back end, uh, the making of a museum can trigger imagination and visual creativity. Or you can also make associations or show the or give the, the audience the opportunity to uh, create themselves and share their uh, creativity. That could work as well. Now, visual images are not only elements of concrete information that is just that are just out there. They also they have another function as well, and they uh, you could say they refer to. Uh, different things. Artworks tell us a story. They tell us a narrative or they are a part of a narrative. Um, in other words, they refer to some kind of a concept, which could be a, sto a storyline. Uh, in fact, it could be just an, an event. Um, Picasso's Guernica, for instance, refers to a certain event or to an idea or to a feeling. Uh, so, Behind each artwork, there, are, there is at least one or several uh, concepts, you could say. And maybe in a lot of cases, not all, but in a lot of cases, that is exactly what is art made for. Not for the visual uh, information they provide only, but for the concepts they, uh, they mirror. And in fact, museum goers and visitors uh, in turn also use different concepts, mostly in, in oral uh, language, uh, to refer to the artworks. Um, Basically, they communicate about the artworks. They, they talk when they're in the galleries. Uh, they comment, uh, criticize, um, and, and then they value or judge. And in most of the cases, uh, museum goers go straight to the judging. They don't, they, they don't even take too much time for visual perception or imagination. Go straight to, to the judging. Um, so visual language and communication is using images in a more abstract, symbolic way. Um, and a museum can help that, you could trigger that um, 
to help the museum goers to uh, go beyond the features embodied in the actual artwork. And how can a museum do that? All the museums do that by offering text, by offering the concepts themselves uh, in the form of, of uh, text, uh, or by showing the artworks in a certain narrative, so uh, which mirrors the concepts, uh, or by uh, giving the audience the chance to come up with their own concepts, uh, their own stories, and to share them uh, with each other. For instance, make up a title or, or, or things like that. Another abstract element, an abstract sub-competency is visual analysis uh, or visual theory, you could say, um, which is the final step of our model. Um, when we analyze a show or when we analyze an artwork, what do we do? We look for, um, we look at the image and the context of the image and we try to approach it in such a way that we reveal, you could say, or we, we, we trace the, the structure and the system that is underneath it. And that's a very interesting uh, to do. For instance, a historical context. And this is uh, analyzing, you could say, and also explaining it, uh, which is the next step if you uh, share things uh, and um, understand things. Um, and in a lot of cases, art museum, to my opinion, uh, do the analyzes themselves and offer it to the audience. They, and, and this analysis is mostly a, an art historical analysis. Um, <clears throat> they offer it to, uh, to the uh, museum goers, but they can also trigger, and this example was given before, so, uh, trigger art, uh, vis the visitors of, uh, of the art museum to do the analysis themselves. Not only the art historical analysis, but also the personal analysis, the societal analysis, uh, the emotional analysis. Uh, etc. This is the model as a whole, and of course, like, uh, and these are the v different sub competencies you could say in the model uh, we made and uh, was mentioned before. I won't go into that again. The element of reflection, of metacognition, is a very important one. You can be aware of using those competencies. You could uh, take some distance from them and you can f reflect on them, how, how you use them, how other people use them, how other musea use them, uh, etc. So that's an important element uh, here as well. So this in general offers a kind of um, grid, you could say, uh, or a kind of uh, framework for uh, the museum to work on. Um, does an art museum has to do all this at the same time? Uh, uh, no, I don't think it's possible. I think it's a matter of choosing and being aware that you choose for a certain thing. You trigger imagination or you trigger uh, visual perception uh, and have a good motivation why you don't do other things at that time. So that, that's how I think uh, uh, such a model uh, works. Uh, and as I said, it has implications both for presentation uh, and curation. And this is... Uh, of course, the work that has to be done and that is uh, done here. And now um, Ernst will uh, tell you a little bit about how we brought this theoretical model, still theoretical model, into the museum and which implications uh, it has for uh, the presentations of the, the works here. Yeah. The next parts are very short and very brief. Um, and we would like to to share our ideas or our reflections on what is this all about and what is what is the sense of this uh, and c can we really use this kind of thinking this kind of, of models for daily practice and the idea is now to apply this model uh, to a gallery and I'm very thankful I'm really very thankful to the Museum M to invite Anvil and to invite our group to discuss about their concept uh, in relation to the model we developed. And this was a wonderful experience. I just show, show you something uh, totally different, but this is something which I showed in, in Riga <laughs> at the presentation. Uh, um, organized by, by Austria from, from, from Latvia. Um, and uh, so what, what, we, what we normally do with, with this model is that we just uh, 
and do this kind of grids uh, or tables, uh, which just show the different um, sub-competences. Uh, this is the first part. And then we have this, what uh, Lode talked about, the social competence, the methodological aspect, uh, the self-competence aspect. And then we have the three dimensions of reflection, knowledge, and, and attitude. And for instance, we, we use this grid uh, to understand what uh, assignments in teaching art at schools, uh, how we can analyze them, and how can we can uh, um, discover the specific profile of a specific assignment or a, a specific task. And this is, uh, it's just, was just an exercise we did. This is an, an assignment a, a teacher gave, and, and he, he gave the material to us, and then we started a discussion about what is the profile of this specific assignment. And then we found this profile, on what, what you can see on the right-hand side. And we transferred especially uh, in this exercise um, to what uh, we were presented uh, here at Museum M. I think that is this a secret? <laughs> you will present it. So uh, I will keep this very short. So this is the the plan for for, for the first uh, room of of Museum M in, in the new concept of of, of presentation, um, and we 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 were introduced to this. Um, uh, model of, of this first room, and you will be introduced very soon as well. So, um, and then um, <laughs> I think it was Peter who showed us this slide. Um, and this is how things normally go. You have some abstract concepts, and you have a room, and then you say, okay, we relate this concept to this uh, point, and th this concept to this point, and so. Um, uh, and that's not the way how we discuss things. <laughs> uh, so we took another step and we, we started to use the model um, uh, Lodi developed um, to, to really to discuss the concept of this room. And we did this very long document um, and it's again again the same uh, grid uh, you can find on, on the left in the left column all these different uh, uh, points from the model. And we had a joint discussion uh, of three people, uh, of Lode, uh, me, and uh, I think it was uh, Piet Hagenas uh, from the Netherlands. Um, and we just gave scores. Is it strongly addressed or is it weakly addressed? And then we, we collected just the, the arguments for, for this judgment. And here you can find an interesting uh, thing that, that where there is a common view of these three uh, externals, um, which are not at all familiar with all your, your considerations here, but just our external point of view. And, and also you can see where we, dif uh, we, we differ. So we have different uh, points as well. So you can see just with the crosses, uh, um, th th this and, and you can also see, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the arguments we, we, we found for our judgment. So um, we did the same um, um, also in respect to the transversal competences and to metacognition and reflection. And there you can also again see where we have a, a same uh, judgment and, and different judgments. So uh, what we deliver is this document uh, to the staff of, of Museum M. Um, I don't know uh, what they did with this document. <laughs> uh, but we wrote also a conclusion. And this conclusion is that Gallery 1, so this was the plan of the Gallery 1, fosters a dominant cognitive approach, mainly based on knowledge, to be acquired in the gallery, in the gallery after the first room. And we could not find possibilities that allow the visitor to show or to perform his knowledge and his ability to interpret. So this was our feedback um, um, to, to, to the staff um, here. And um, I'm very curious about how things are developing here <laughs> and whether our considerations are w w were at all helpful uh, for your discussions and your decisions. 
Um, so thank you very much. That's all.